standing firm on the solid foundation. I'll stay in the old time way. The way that believes in Jesus. For he makes lost sinners brand new. The way that believes the Bible.
Because he loved me, my Savior died on the cross, was crucified. No greater love for mortal man has ever been known. Oh, praise his dear name, he loved me so. Now I'm his, he is mine, I know. He suffered it all because he loved me. Then they carried him away, placed him in a lowly grave. Surely they thought that this would be the end of this man. But on that third and glorious day, God came and rolled the stone away. He rose from the dead because he loved me. Because he loved me, my Savior died. On the cross was crucified. No greater love for mortal man has ever been known. Oh, praise his dear name, he loved me so. Now I am his, he is mine, I know. He suffered it all because he loved me. Because he loved me, my Savior died on the cross, was crucified. No greater love for mortal man has ever been known. Oh, praise is your name, he loved me so. Now I am his, he's mine, I know. He suffered it all because he loved me. He suffered it all because he loved me. timbers lay obscured by weeds now grown to where the common passerby might never even know that this old tree once held a king who wore a thorny cross came down but the Lord lives on wood and nails could not prevail on resurrection dawn that 
that rugged tree is a memory, but his blood redeems right now. Praise God, his grace still saves today after the cross came down. No great museum will display the cross where Jesus died. For things of earth shall pass away, yet his love will abide. He reached through time and met my need when his blood touched Calvary's ground. Then Christ arose within my soul after a memory but his blood redeems right now praise God his grace still saves today after people get on Noah's Ark. Marsh and I had the opportunity, as some of you have, this, we went last year down to Kentucky to see the replica of Noah's Ark. Matter of fact, I think I put a pic, not yet up there, but I think it's up there, Jason. Took a picture of it while we were down there, and it is a replica of what Noah's Ark was supposed to look, look like, and it is massive. Uh, and especially when you think back in the day that Noah built the ark. And if you get an opportunity, it's well worth going. Uh, some of you just recently went and, uh, and saw it. And it's massive as you walk through it. I think there's three floors to it. And, uh, you know, time you go through the one, all the, then the second, the next floor. Uh, you, you, you see how massive it is. And... In there, they also show you examples, which I hadn't given a lot of thought to until I actually went through. They, they give you uh, examples of how they believe that Noah got the water to all the animals, how they got rid of the waste uh, of the animals. And it's, it's pretty fascinating when you go through, through the ark. And, and yet, I asked myself, why did, you know, it's sizable. I mean, it had animals and it had Noah's family, but certainly other people could have gotten on the ark. Uh, it's huge. But then, you know, we have this hurricane taking place, even as we speak, down in Texas. And even though they were warned, Category 4, there's people saying, no, I'm not going anywhere. You know, this is, I'm going to be fine. And, you know, don't bother me. And you think, you know... Don't you get the message? And then people have to come in there and risk their lives to save them. There, there's just something about people that uh, they don't respond to warnings. Now, I'm, I'm sure there were thousands that poured out of, out of there, which was, which was the wise thing to do. 
But it's fascinating that in Noah's day, with all the numbers of people that were there, the no one wanted to get on the ark. And so I think it's also an indicator of the times in which we live um, that we can preach and preach and preach about the return of the Lord and, and that he's coming in a, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, indicating that it could just happen anytime. And yet people just shrug it off like big deal, you know, what difference does it make? And so let's look at a few reasons this morning, uh, and maybe we can relate to why people do not respond to the Word of God, um, even as they didn't respond back in Noah's day. Heavenly Father, I pray you'll bless the reading of your Word this morning, the preaching of it. I pray you'll stir hearts, help us to be ready whenever the Lord takes us home. Uh, God, may our hearts be prepared, may we be serving, may we be occupying until you come. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In chapter 17, verse 26, it says, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Uh, Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot, They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went outside of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. And so here he he shows us the conditions of the day. They were busy with life, doing what they normally do. And all of a sudden... um, judgment came now it's interesting because in both of those cases right there uh, there was a warning and so let's look at some reasons why people would not get on the ark number one they only had Noah's word to act upon they only had Noah's word to act upon Um, and that's the thing about Christianity and a relationship with God is it's all faith You have to believe by faith. God loves that plan that he has set up that you only get to God through faith. Um, Without faith, the Bible says, it's impossible to please God. So in this particular case, they had Noah speaking to them and saying, Hey, God is going to destroy this world. Uh, You need to get rid of your sinful lifestyle. You need to change your ways. Uh, or God's going to destroy this planet. Now, the Bible says in 2 Peter 2, 5, speaking of God, spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person. He was a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So he is a preacher of righteousness. He's telling people, listen, your, your lifestyle's terrible. Uh, you know what you're doing is wrong. And God is dishonored and he's displeased with your behavior. Now, that kind of preaching goes out even today in which we live. But very few people listen to it. Very few people change their lifestyles at all. They just continue on like they always do. Uh, it's, like, uh, it's like John the Baptist. When John the Baptist came, they asked him, you know, who are you? He says, I'm a voice in the wilderness. And that's the way it is with people who are preaching about the the conditions of this world. It's like they're a voice in the wilderness. Yes, it's there, but, you know, who pays attention to it? Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He warned the people that if they did not cease, again, their sinful ways, their activities, God would destroy the world in which they lived. Now, it's one thing to be in a hurricane, <clears throat> and, um, you know, they say, leave, and you say, nah, I, th- I, think, I think I can weather the storm. I'm going to go down to my cellar. I'm going to do this and this and this, this. You know, there's the possibility that you will survive. There is. Granted, there is that possibility. But in this particular case, there was no possibility. Noah said if... If you don't change, if God brings judgment, you're going to die. 
bottom line, no ifs, ands, buts about it. You can't dig a basement. You can't go up on the highest mountain. You're going to die. And so, boy, that makes the, uh, the conditions a lot more severe. And yet they still didn't listen to him. And so you ask yourself, why wouldn't they believe him? Because it was just him. He, he was just preaching. And what does he know? I can imagine him saying, what in the world does he know? And why should we believe him? In a way, it's a good question. Why should we believe you, Noah? No one else is saying this. Well, Noah was doing something else other than preaching. He was building. And he wasn't just building a small boat. <laughs> he was building a, a, a huge thing. I mean, it's massive. And so, I mean, it was so massive it had to be comical to the people. But the fact is, he was backing up his statement with his act of faith. In other words, I believe God. God told me this, and I believe God. And therefore, for the next 120 years, what am I going to be doing? I'm going to be building this boat. And you're going to mock it, and you're going to laugh at it and ridicule me. But I believe it enough that I'm going to continue to build this boat. And so he was backing up his preaching with his actions and his behavior. Hebrews 11:7 7 says, By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. They hadn't seen a flood. They hadn't seen anything like this. They hadn't seen rain. And so, being seen of things as not yet, he would move with fear. He had a respect. He reverenced God. He believed God. And so he prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. And so he exercised his faith by doing what God told him to do. Now, you would have thought there would have been some people there who said, you know, this guy really believes this. I mean, he's really into it. This thing's really starting to take shape. You know, maybe, the, maybe there's something to this. And when you looked at Noah's life, he was a per person of righteousness. He wasn't involved in the violence. He wasn't involved in the criminal activity. He wasn't involved in the parties and all the wickedness that was going on. And so his life was even different. And you might think, you know, this guy might be in touch with God. If anybody's in touch with God, it may very well be Noah. And I also believe that in their conscience, they knew that what Noah was preaching was right. And that is, they were wicked. Notice, let's jump back to uh, uh, Genesis very quickly. Uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 11. And it says, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Well, that's because the people were that way. They were corrupt, and they were violent. It goes ahead and says, in verse 12, For God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, and all flesh had corrupted his way before the, uh, upon the earth. Now, God gives us a conscience. Even back in those days, they had to look around, even as we look around today. Even lost people look around today and say, something's wrong with our country. These riots and destruction and death and the crime and the hatred, there's something wrong with that. Even their conscience says, Noah, what you're saying is, is true. The earth is filled with violence. It's full of corruption. Well, who's doing that? You are. You're the people who are producing this. And this is the very reason that God's going to destroy this world if you don't change your ways. And so people today even 
know that they're not pleasing God. And the sins they're committing are against God. They know it. They act like they don't know it. They pretend like they don't know it. They pretend like nothing's wrong. But down deep in their conscience, they know that it's wrong. They know they're sinning against God. They know they're sinning against the standards of God. That's why they don't turn to God, because they don't want to change their behavior. And so, number one, they just had Noah's word to act upon. We have the word of God today. And we get up and try to share people the word of God. We're saying, it's not me the preacher, but it's the Bible. Here's what the Bible says in the last days these things are going to take place. You need to prepare yourself for the end times. What do people do? Most of them pass it off. Why? They just don't believe the word of God. And that's why it's so important that we take the Word of God, we need to study the Word of God, we need to keep in the Word of God, uh, live by the Word of God, because it is accurate. It instructs us on how to live. And so, let's look at number two. They saw that the ark was, in their mind, too confining and restricting. And that's the reason why a lot of people don't like Christianity. They see it as too confining and restricting. Matthew 7, 14 says this. It's talking about eternal life. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now the Lord is right outspoken about this. He says, uh, if you want eternal life, it's a narrow way. Few there be that find it. And you know, it's amazing how people in their mind think, I'm going to be fine. I'll make it if anybody makes it. And yet, they live a terrible life. And yet their mind somehow can justify their actions and behavior and convince them that God's okay with their lifestyle. It's amazing what our mind is able to do. But then again, Satan is the great deceiver. And he can blind people's minds. And he does this especially with receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. The reason more people are getting saved in other countries today is because America, in America, we think we can do things our way. Now this has evolved, I hate that word, but nevertheless it has evolved over a period of time. There was a day in America when we really looked to God and trusted God and his word and tried to live by his principles and precepts. Uh, That has long changed. Thank God for those who still believe that. That's the only hope we have for this country are those who are still standing on the word of God. You recall Frank Sinatra even sang this song entitled My Way. And it is interesting once you look at the... uh, lyrics of the song it's all about my way i did it my way did this was this was this 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 but i did it my way and this this concept has been passed on to people in our culture we want to do everything our way even go to heaven find a way to heaven um even stamp out god if it's possible We'll find a way to do it. They just are so wrapped up in their own self that they can come to a solution about everything by their own means. But the problem with that thinking is there is only one way. (laughs) There aren't any other ways. The way is narrow. The way is straight that leads to everlasting life. And the truth of of the fact of the matter is Few there are that find it. There's not a lot of Christians compared to the population of the world. You see, there's only one sacrifice for sin. There's not a lot of sacrifices for sin. And it was the perfect, sinless sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Now, If you don't want to even believe the fact that there had to be a sacrifice for sin, that's fine. And a lot of people don't even go there. 
I don't even buy into all that stuff. That's fine. But I'm telling you, according to God's plan, the God, the God who set this entire thing up, the God who has given you life, he's the one that set the plan up, and he says that there is only one way. And it comes through the sacrifice, sacrifice of my son, Jesus Christ, upon the cross. And it's the only sacrifice that I'm satisfied with. It's the only one that's acceptable to, to me. Cain was a good example of that, Cain and Abel. Cain brought a fruit basket. Abel brought a, 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 a sacrificial lamb. And God says, I'm not pleased, Cain, with yours. In other words, I don't have to receive what you offer me. And so all these religions of the world offer God something. But God says, I'm not pleased with that. I don't have to accept that. I'm only accepting the sacrifice of my son Jesus Christ on Calvary. That's it. And only by placing your faith and trust in my son Jesus Christ will you get eternal life. The way is narrow. And a lot of people don't like that. There's only one rule book. And it's the word of God. It has 66 books in it. And it's written by God himself. There's only one author of the book. There's not a lot of authors. Even though God used men to write the book, God is the author of the book. And, and so there's only one way. There's only one book. There's only one God. There's only one heaven. And so people say that's too restrictive. That's too confining. And secondly, they thought not only... I don't want to do it your way, Noah. But they really, I suppose, looked at the ark itself and said, you expect me to get on that? And look at that thing. It's got a bunch of animals in there. It stinks. It's uncomfortable. It's not fun. I mean, what will I do during the day? In other words, it will curb my freedom. Don't we hear that today? And above all, it won't be fun. Everything has to be fun. Church has to be fun today. Young people are bored if they're not having fun. They can't even imagine sitting down and comprehending. And then not, not all young people. Thank God for the good ones. But the, the masses of them, I'm saying, saying, what are we going to do that's fun today? We're going to learn something about the Word of God. No, you don't understand. I said, what are we going to do that's fun. Well, that can be enjoyable if you have a heart for God. Oh, brother, I don't want to go to that church. I don't want to go to Sunday school. I don't want to do it. Why? Because it's not fun. They're saying the same thing. Thousands of years ago, nothing has changed. It won't be any fun. It's not going to be enjoyable. Now, I'll be the first to say that sometimes the Christian life can be pretty stressful. It's pretty difficult. It's not easy. You have people that um, will misrepresent you. They'll reject you. They don't want you in your company. Um, and we have to battle the flesh, and that's, that's hard. We have to stand against Satan. There's a battle that rages constantly. We can't just do whatever Satan wants us to do. We fight against that constantly. And so we have to engage him on a, on a regular basis. And it's not an enjoyable situation. But the end result is worth it. Amen? And when you get to heaven, you'll say, thank God for, for the battles that was fought. Christians are faced with suffering. No one in his family were glad after 120 years of hammering away, preaching righteousness, being mocked probably and laughed at, and I'm sure there were jokes back in those days about Noah and his family. But the fact is, when it was all said and done, he got on the boat, believing God, fearing God, and God shut him in. Nobody else got on. He stood there, the Bible says, for seven days. It didn't rain for seven days. There was kind of a period of grace. Everybody stood there and waited. 
see what's going to happen. And probably about two or three, four days into this thing, they're probably saying, see, we told you. We told you that you're just a joke to our community. Until the raindrops started falling. Then, all of a sudden, it got serious. But the problem is, it was too late. It's too late. Had they reached out by faith and believed him and said, I'm going to get on the ark. It made all the difference. And God did, in fact, destroy the world. Now, we know that as hindsight. He destroyed the world. Which brings me to the third point. They did not believe that a loving God would destroy them. Well, we hear a lot about the love of God today. Matter of talk about you know, talking about the th theology and it's evolving. evolving. Uh, now, you know, more and more people are moving away from hell. Uh, the God of love. God's love is so overwhelming that he couldn't allow anybody to go to hell. God's so, love is so overwhelming he couldn't bring judgment upon anybody. And so on and so forth. Isaiah 13, 11, God says this, I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Now that's not talking about the flood. It's talking about the end times. In other words, there's coming a time in the future that God says, I'm going to punish the world for their evil. The tribulation period is that period of time. It's a seven-year period, and it's a period that really refers to the Jewish nation. God says in Daniel, there's 70 periods of years determined upon the nation of Israel. 69 years, we know those have passed. Israel's waiting for the last seven years. And that's going to take place during the tribulation period. In between, there's a 2,000-year church period where the Lord set Israel aside. And he's working with the Gentiles. And Gentiles are getting saved all over the world. Jews rarely get saved. There are Jews that are getting saved. Thank God for that. But for the most part, God's using this period as a time to reach the Gentile world. But God's not through with the Jews. Matter of fact, the whole tribulation period is primarily for the Jews. The 70th week of Daniel, the last seven years, is designed for the Jew. And it's designed to bring them to their Messiah. They've rejected him for 2,000 years, but God said, I'm going to give space to the Gentiles so they can be saved. Thank God. You know, allowed us to be saved. But there's a time coming when God says, I'm through with you. Now, there'll be Gentiles saved. But for the most part, I'm bringing this about for the Jews. Persecution is coming. And the pressure will be so great upon them that when they think that they're going to even cease to exist, God says they will cry out to me once again, as they did even in Egypt. And God will send his deliverer. And it will be the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And they will see him coming and see him and mourn as they see the nail prints in his hands but they will receive him as their Messiah. I'm glad as a child of God, I do not have to go through that terrible, terrible period of the tribulation period. God makes it very clear. He gives us many passages of scripture that tells us that we're not appointed unto wrath because it's really to bring judgment upon the wicked, not the righteous, and it's to bring the Jews to repentance. That's what it's for. 
And God will do that, and we'll see a type of that in just a second. But the fact is, God did destroy the earth in Noah's day. They said a loving God wouldn't do this. He did that. Why did he do it? Because he's just. He's a just God. He, he's both just and he's both loving. And uh, I was talking to somebody that asked me the other day, I was trying to think of it very quickly, but they was asking me about the woman caught in adultery. And I said, you know, that's a great thing. God excused her and showed her grace. But being a just God, he couldn't over the, overlook the fact that she had committed a sin. She was guilty. According to the law, she was guilty. And so, and this is exactly why they brought the woman to Jesus, to catch him. How can he extend her grace when he, it's very clear that she has broken the law? And they were hoping to catch him. They always were trying to catch him. It's a great example. They throw this woman down and said, hey, she's caught in, very, in the very act of adultery. What are you going to do? You're going to condemn her because the law says so? Or are you going to break the law and set her free? Boy, they thought they had him. But uh, you, don't, you don't get God. You don't trap God. Hey. Jesus bends over and he begins to write in the dirt. And they're watching him. And then he writes some more in the dirt. And from the eldest to the youngest, they start walking away. What did he write? That's always been the controversy. What did he write? Maybe their names. Maybe their sins. Whatever he wrote spoke to their heart. And they saw their guilt. And one after the other walked away. And this is important. Because then the Lord looked at the woman and says, where art thou thine accusers? There are none. Oh. Oh, okay. Now I can give you grace. Because there's nobody bringing any charges against you. Boy, what a God that we have. He released her from all the law. They just left. They couldn't stand up against God. And he says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. That's the grace of God. But he had to deal with the justice of God as well. And God is a just God. And if you don't want the grace of God, you will see the justice of God. Thank God for grace. Amen. <laughs> Aren't you glad you're forgiven? Let's hurry. Number four, four they felt safe with the majority. They felt safe with the majority. Matthew 7, 13. Enter in at the straight gate. Wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. The majority of the world take the broad road. They're not listening to Noah. They're not listening to God. They're not listening to his word. And they take the broad road. And it says, many go in thereat. Well, if you look at the statistics of the world, 67% of the world's population do not even profess to trust Christ as their Savior. 67% make no bones about it. They're either Hindus or they're Buddhists, or they believe in other religions, they're atheists, um, the Muslims, you know, take all these different faiths that do not look to Jesus Christ as their Messiah. You've got the atheists as well. Throw that, those in there. And so two-thirds of the population of the world don't even consider him as, as the Savior of the world. And then you take the churches that claim to be Christian. <laughs> 
And you wonder, really, sometimes how these churches can even claim to be Christian with what they teach and what they preach. And yet they fall under this umbrella of being Christian, Protestant, or whatever. And it's very questionable, even of the numbers in those churches who have sincerely given their hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ. In Noah's day, only Noah and his family did God find righteous. Can you imagine that? Out of everybody on the planet, only Noah. And it's very clear in the Bible. Genesis 7, 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house unto the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Just Noah. So the fact that these churches put Christian on it or claim to be a Christian denomination doesn't mean anything. What are they teaching? What are they preaching? How are they living? Are they really abiding by the word of God? Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many there be which go in thereat. Genesis 27, 23 continues. It says, And every living substance was destroyed, which is upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle, and creeping thing, the fowl of the heaven. And they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. Because, and, and, and because the, the lost are the majority in the world today, it's the lost in the world that's shaping our world and our laws and our system. If the lost are in the majority, they're the ones who are shaping the world. So it's no wonder we see everything deteriorating and going downhill, downhill, downhill because of the influence of the majority of the people which are lost. But what they don't understand is that God is just, along with being a God of love. He will judge the world for its sin. And yet I like the fact that he's not going to judge the righteous at the same time. I'm glad he took my judgment, Jesus Christ did. Turning your Bibles just quickly as an example of this. Genesis chapter 18 Verse 23. This is a powerful passage of scripture right here. It's a great type in the Bible. You recall God is going to overthrow Sodom and Gomorrah. And so God sends some angels to Abraham, and Abraham's nephew Lot is down in Sodom and says, uh, Abraham, uh, we're going to go down there and we're going to destroy Sodom. And, and Abraham's concerned for his family. So he wants to bargain with God. But notice what it says. It carries tremendous impact on the person of God. In 1823, and Abraham drew near and said, Will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? He asked God a good question. Will you destroy the righteous at the same time as you destroy the wicked? It's a good question. I want to know the answer. He says in verse 24, Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Will thou also destroy and not spare the place for fifty righteous that are therein? Would you not do that? And then he says this, That be far from thee to do after this manner. He says, I don't believe you'd do it. To slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? What a powerful statement Abraham's having with God. God, certainly you're not going to destroy the righteous with the wicked. Far be it from you. What's he, how's he address him? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And so what does God do? He says, all right, Abraham, let's negotiate. 
All right, for 50, I won't do it. Well, what about 40, 45? All right, I won't do it. What about 30, 20, 10? He says, I'm not going to judge the righteous with the wicked. It's all about that principle. He gets down to 10. And Abraham's thinking in his mind, surely my kids are down there and my nephew, surely there's at least 10 that are righteous there. But they couldn't find 10, could they? So the angel says, Lot, you got to get out of here. Now notice in that same chapter, in chapter 19, verse 22, the angel comes, gets a hold of Lot, his wife, his daughters, says, haste the escape, for I cannot do anything till thou come thither. I can't do it. I cannot condemn and bring judgment upon the righteous at the same time as the wicked. Now, we're talking about the judgment of Almighty God. Big difference than Nebuchadnezzar putting people to death and so on. But God, and that's why, that's why if you're a child of God, God repeatedly states in the Bible that you are saved from the wrath to come. God will not pour out his wrath upon you as a child of God. He's going to take you home, and he gives us the promise. Romans 5, 9, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. The apostle Paul told the believers in Thessalonica to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which deliver us from the wrath to come. I encourage people, give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ because you're not going to want to suffer the wrath that's going to come upon this planet because God is a just God. He's going to deal once again with the Jews and he's going to once again deal with the wicked on this planet. He's going to judge the sinners out of it, the Bible says. There will be people saved in the tribulation period. They understand this going in. When they accept Christ as their personal Savior, they understand what's coming upon this earth. But I'm so glad to be part of the church age, the bride of Christ, and he's going to come in a moment in the twinkling of an eye to catch you and me away. Now, these people felt safe with the majority, but Noah proved them wrong because Noah and his family were saved but the rest of the people who were the violent, the wicked, all that crowd was judged. Same thing with Sodom and Gomorrah. They were judged. Lot and his family was removed. Lastly, the reason they didn't get on the ark is they thought they could get in at the last moment. They thought they could get in at the last moment. Back in Genesis chapter 7, the Bible says, And they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all the flesh, and God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. God was the one who chose the time to close the door of the ark. The people today feel like they have a right to dictate the rules of God. You can't do it. I can't do it. Nobody can dictate the rules of Almighty God. He's going to do what he wants to do. And he's already laid it out. And um, you cannot put God in a box. The wrath of God's coming. You've heard, if you've heard the gospel and rejected it, God says he'll even send you a strong delusion in the tribulation that you'll believe a lie of the Antichrist. There will be a lie. It'll be a good lie. And God says this, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. <clears throat> so we're seeing a repeat of what's happened way back in Noah's day. That's why he says, As it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be in the last days. We're seeing the repeat, the same mindset of people who said, no, I'll just wait and see, if, uh, see what happens. 
and then, uh, then I'll make a decision. It'll be too late. It'll be too late. We see that those waited in Noah's day waited too long. A traveler chanced upon a beautiful villa situated on the shores of a beautiful lake in Switzerland, far from the beaten track of tourists. The traveler knocked at the gate, and the aged warden undid its heavy fastenings and bid him to enter. The aged man seemed glad to see him and showed him around the wonderful and beautiful garden. The traveler says, how long have you been here? The old gardener says, I've been here for 24 years. And how often has your master been here? Four times. When was he here last? Twelve years ago. Does he write often? Never. Where do you receive your pay? From an agent, agent in the mainland. Well, who then does come here? No one. He says, I'm almost always here alone. It's very seldom that even a stranger comes by as you did today. The traveler says, but yet you have the garden in such perfect order. Everything's flourishing. I mean, it's beautiful. It's as though you were expecting the master to come today. He says, sir, he says, it is as though the master is coming today. That's what I do. And that's exactly what we're to do. We're to live and look as though he's coming today. And I hope you're living a life like that. That you're honoring God each and every day. You have placed your faith in trust in Jesus Christ. Because when he closes the door, he closes the door. You don't want to be left out. And if you're living a life that's not honorable to God, get it right. And get your life right with God so that you'll not be ashamed when he comes and takes you home. Stand with me. I'll stay in the old time way The way that believes in Jesus For he makes lost sinners brand new The way that believes the Bible And proclaims every word is true Jesus. 
Get ready for your victory. Mission in the name. 